Asile, The Engineer and the Island. Week 45, Day 1. I've now been on the island for 11 months. It's a new week, and the rains are back hard. I think I'm starting to notice a pattern. Almost every time it gets really sunny for a while, a bad storm blows in again, probably because the heat lowers the local air pressure significantly. It was no skin off my nose today, though, because I had enough chemicals to do another mining day. I got up, changed out the vortex drill battery, and started blasting. I finally exhausted that one vein I was following into the walls, about two meters deep, and moved on to a new one. Half of the work anymore is just gathering up all the ore that gets scattered across the shaft by the blast. At the end of the day, I loaded the ore into the grinder for the night, but then realized I'd forgotten about the electrolysis cell again. So the last round of transformer plates was a bit thick. It's technically not too big a deal. The transformer will just be a little less efficient from hysteresis losses, but it's still annoying. And all I really had time to do with it at the end of the day was to remove the plates so they wouldn't get any thicker. It's encouraging, though, to know that between the mining and the electrolysis of iron plates, I should have everything needed for an AC power grid by next week. Week 45, Day 2 still pretty wet out today, so I stayed indoors for the most part. After replacing the vortex drill battery, I worked on chiseling out those transformer plates, and then I stopped ignoring my other projects and checked on the cultures in my incubator again, which had only been neglected for three days this time. I then tested different sections of different cultures with the different colors of dye I had letting them sit for a moment, before adding water to dilute the color away from anything that hadn't absorbed it. And just in case it would help, I added a little bit of my low-concentration iodine solution to see if it would help any of the dyes stick. In the end, some of my dyes were mildly effective at staining different species of microorganism different colors. Not enough to help me see organelles or anything, but just enough contrast to make them easier for me to see and identify against the background light. I decided to start writing a new book to record my microbiological studies, beginning with an outline of the preparation and application procedures for the dyes and cultures. I then spent several hours studying the different microbe species under my microscope. Some of the larger ones, like tardigrades, paramecia, and amoebae, I could identify easily, even without the stains. The smaller bacteria and fungi, however, I needed stains for, and with no better way to differentiate them or compare them to known species, I classified them by an arbitrary color code, according to the kinds of stains they absorbed. Once I was done drawing pictures of the different individual microbes and overall culture shapes in my book, I proceeded to separate one culture at a time into the new sterile petri dishes and incubated them again for different experiments later, namely to see how they'll respond to different chemicals, temperatures, and exposure to sunlight. This will not only help me identify how to kill certain microbes if I need to, but the latter test in particular interests me as a way to determine which species of microbe are photosynthetic, as an additional way to classify them. I was so engrossed in these experiments and descriptions that I completely lost track of time. I had a late lunch and then decided to switch gears. While I've enjoyed my little Pokemon game, it does feel like it lacks a certain level of nuance after a while, even with the additional role-playing elements I've added to it. I guess that sort of thing is less fun alone, or when you're forced to give it a specific interpretation, like when writing a book. However, the resemblance of what I've created to a choose-your-own-adventure book makes me wonder which of my other beloved games I could easily convert into that style particularly my favorite mist-likes. 
In this case, I don't think it's really the act of playing them or reading them that's really the point. Even when I had those games on computers, I didn't replay them too often, except for when I simply wanted to go back and enjoy the beautiful environments. In my current situation, however, the fun seems to be not in actually using these books or games, but simply the act of creating them somehow makes me become far more immersed and engrossed in the material than just absorbing it. The Myst series in particular was probably largely responsible for getting me interested in creative writing in the first place, as I had no other way to express or build the myriad wonders that filled my mind growing up. And the prospect of being able to create whole worlds through something as simple and universal as writing was also very tempting. I guess I still am. And there's nothing to really stop me from continuing to do so here, as long as I have paper and ink. Therefore, I pulled out another one of the blank books I had lying on the shelves, and decided to start writing and drawing in it, specifically trying to recreate the experience of playing Myst in a choose-your-own-adventure format. I was initially just using this as a bit of an experiment. As I went, however, I found that there were a few complicating factors in converting the game into a choose-your-own-adventure book. In particular, the puzzles, many of which relied on mechanical responses to the player's inputs. While something like the tower rotation puzzle was easy, for example, if you choose to turn the tower to aim at the spaceship turn to page XYZ, and you see a particular clue on that page, but turning the puzzles themselves into page numbers without just giving away which page to turn to was kind of tricky. It turned out to be harder than I thought it would be, and I've been enjoying the challenge. One thing I came up with was creating an alphanumeric substitution cipher on the puzzle pages. I was aware of one kind of cipher that's almost impossible to crack without maybe a supercomputer, where a specific sequence of letters taken from a passage of text is used for the substitution. For example, if I used this paragraph for that cipher, I would equal A, W would equal B, A would equal C, S would equal D, etc. This makes it essential that the reader actually turn to that page, or insert a word or phrase from a previous clue to solve the cipher, which is used to encode the next page number that needs to be turned to. I realize now that this has the potential for telling much more complicated and interactive stories, almost like the old text adventure games like Zork and Colossal Cave Adventure. I had a lot of fun with this, and with describing and drawing the scenes, so I was kind of disappointed when it was time to go to bed. Week 45, Day 3 I thought the rain was easing up last night, but I found it still hammering the roof when I got up in the morning. It would have been more annoying, though, if I didn't have my writing project to look forward to. I changed out the vortex drill battery when I got up, and then checked on my microbe cultures again. The cloned cultures have gotten big enough for me to conduct a few tests on them, though sadly there hasn't been enough sun today to test their responsiveness to sunlight and UV radiation. However, I was able to test how they reacted to different compounds, like ethanol, methanol, iodine, ammonia, vinegar, potash, and dissolved metal sulfides. I also tested various plant, animal, and fungi extracts, as I'm aware that a lot of plants produce antibacterial and antifungal compounds in the tropics, protect themselves, which I could use in turn as medicines once identified. Other plant and animal extracts were used to feed the cultures and see what kinds of food they were most likely to grow on. For example, I'm aware that Clostridium botulinum grows in exposed meat, and E. coli grows in animal digestive systems. 
And yes, I did use a small stool sample for some of these experiments, as well as samples from my compost pile to examine the differences between microbe diversity in different stages of waste decay. This is why it's so important to wash your food and hands. I cycled between describing new cultures and testing new compounds on them before returning them to the incubator. This gave them some time to respond to the compounds before I checked on them again and wrote down the results. As expected, a lot of the chemicals like ethanol, methanol, ammonia, potash, and vinegar killed a lot of the microbe cultures, though to differing degrees, which was interesting to take note of. Vinegar is in fact a weapon that microbes use against each other to, in effect, defend their territory. As a result, certain species appear to have developed an immunity to it. In contrast, the presence of an alkali like potash destroys this chemical defense and it makes these microbes vulnerable to other species if they don't just die from it outright. This is another tool I can use to control them. And of course, the plant extracts yielded mixed results. Some killed bacteria, some fed their growth, most had no appreciable effect. It was the ones that went berserk in meat that interested me the most, however, as potential sources of disease. The logic being that if they liked to grow in dead meat, they would probably like to grow in live meat, named my body, almost as much. So I took careful note of these strains and set them aside for more extensive culturing for future experiments. I was also particularly interested in which bacteria responded positively to the metal sulfides, as I was aware of certain species of geobacter that feed on sulfur and or sulfide minerals. Some species of these microbes produce electricity when forced to feed in anaerobic conditions, that is, without oxygen. And I've had ideas in the past for how these kinds of microbes might be made to leach useful or toxic metals from soil or rock and concentrate them for human use, which would be very helpful to me here, where I'm perpetually low on metals. However, that's a project for the far future, if ever. I just like the idea of being able to harness microbes to become my very own programmable nanomachines, which I suppose in a way they already are. I stopped for lunch after I was done with my controlled torture of microbes and got back to my writing for most of the remainder of the afternoon. I divided my book into different chapters based on the ages of mist, stone ship, mechanical, channel wood, and spaceship with a short bit for Denis at the end, as well as an epilogue chapter containing Rhyme from the Real Mist game, and as a bit of a tease for Riven, which I'll probably write later. A lot of the work was just filling in the blanks I'd already made for myself, and considering what options were available in each scene. At the same time, though, I found myself having all sorts of excuses to expand on the story, the environment, and the options for interacting with it as my imagination ran with it. Bits and pieces that helped fill in various gaps that always seemed to be missing, or that fleshed out the mist ages as places where people actually lived. For example, even though Mist was supposed to be the home of Atris and his family, there was nothing there to suggest that anyone ever lived there. No bedrooms, no bathrooms, no food production, storage, or preparation facilities. Just books, and overcomplicated ways of keeping them hidden. While they could have gotten their food easily by linking to other ages, without all those other things, Mist is just a transport hub, not a home. The island was so small, though, that it was hard to find places to add these facilities. Nevertheless, I did find ways of filling in a few of the gaps. In particular, I made the elevator room a bit of a hub around which the different bedrooms were arranged, along with a passage leading to a sort of veranda carved out of the cliffs on the back side of the island, which I also considered to be an appropriate place for a kitchen, dining room, and bathroom. I also wrote in an intervening level in the mountain tower where Atris built his study, for writing ages in peace and safety. Explains why the elevator always had that odd habit of stopping halfway up and turning before rising the rest of the way. If they needed to, they could probably fish for food, 
and who can say what kind of magic plants might have been brought to Mist from other ages for growing food, even on that small island. So I considered throwing in a few berry bushes as well. Adding all these little homey touches to Mist was a great mental and imaginative exercise for me, but even with all the fun I was having, my eyes and brain still ended up wearing out a little bit at the end of the day when I got ready for bed, though my imagination remains on fire. Week 45, Day 4 I had a hard time falling asleep last night, and even started to dream a little about the stuff I've been writing and the games I've been making, which is a welcome departure from the nightmares I was having before. The rain diminished today to a bit of a drizzle, which I liked, and which I decided shouldn't stop me from foraging today. When I was done, and dried off a little, I got back to my microbiological studies, especially having gotten some fresh plants to test for antibacterial properties this morning. However, I was more interested today in the cultures that I'd left to grow uncontrolled and collapse. I washed the contents of these cultures into a test tube and set them in the cellar to keep their contents preserved while I waited for new cultures of the same microbes to grow. In the meantime, I peered through my microscope and drew more microbial species until lunch. After that, I spent the remainder of the afternoon writing and drawing in my mist book. I mostly worked on Selenitic, or the Spaceship Age, because it was always one of my favorites, but at the same time, it always seemed too small, too short. There wasn't a lot going on above ground beyond the oasis and the Forest of Crystals. Also, why was there just a random clock standing next to the path, and why was it broken? In contrast, the underground area of the level was always much more extensive, but you never really got to see it during the tram ride, which itself always seemed like a very difficult civil engineering project for one man to build, even with his son's help, and that's saying a lot coming from me, considering what I've built here so far. Then I thought about the question of where all of Cirrus's gold came from, and had the idea that maybe he and Akinar were deporting the conquered citizens of other ages to Selenitic to work the mines for them. That gave the age a much more sinister function in the narrative, which I suppose now officially classifies as fan fiction, and may also explain not only the security behind the mine access door, and trams, but also the microphones, which they may have used to communicate with the workers down in the mine, perhaps giving the impression that they were always watching. And perhaps, when Cirrus and Akinar finally left all the other ages for dead, one of the last survivors on Selenitic broke the clock, like a punch-out clock in a factory, as a final act of defiance. I liked these ideas and ran with them in my writing particularly making it necessary to leave the tram at each stop to look for clues for where to go next, especially since the method from the game, using sound cues, wouldn't work as well in a book format. This also necessitated that I make the underground maze much smaller than in the original game. One, so I wouldn't wear myself out, but two, so I could also pack each stop with more details, like geothermal power stations, lava pits where uncooperative prisoners were thrown in, or caves full of bats or blind albino cave creatures. It was a lot of fun, and I got a good portion of it done before it was time for bed. Week 45, Day 5 the weather was nice today, so after conducting my morning chores and changing out the vortex drill battery, I decided to make this a paper day, as I've been using up a lot for my writing projects lately. I gathered extra plant material in the morning, and spent the day alternating between soaking and grinding the cellulose and keeping the solar kiln full of lime, 
although I would have preferred continuing my microbiological studies. Since I didn't want my cultures to go bad again, however, I did take the time before lunch to at least test my phage culture on one of the bacterial cultures that had not yet grown to a self-destructive size. At the end of the day, I also had a lot of thread stockpiled, so I loaded the loom, greased all the moving parts, and set it to run overnight. Week 45, Day 6 It's the end of the work week, and although it was another nice day, I'd gotten just enough chemical stockpiled to do another round of mining. I really wanted to get the power grid up and running as soon as possible, so I went for it, spending most of the day blasting and collecting rubble for the grinder. At lunch, I did stop to check on my phage experiment again. The phages didn't kill the bacteria outright like I was hoping they would, but the solution certainly slowed down their growth compared to the control culture. This gave me some ideas. While I can't engineer the phages' DNA directly, I can mess with natural selection a little bit to create phage cultures that are more virulent than they would otherwise be in nature, effectively selectively breeding viruses. I left the cultures alone for today, but the ones that have seen the least bacterial growth I'll separate and culture again later, kind of using the bacterial cultures to feed the viruses and grow more of them. Then I got back to my mining, fortunately finding a pocket in the rock that was a little more concentrated with copper than normal. I really needed that break. Combined with the small amount of ores in the sand pulled up by the vortex drill, I'll hopefully have enough metal tomorrow to finish this project. I loaded the ore into the grinder at the end of the day to separate overnight. Week 45, Day 7 Just my luck now that I had the ore I needed, for the first week in an entire month, it rained on a Sabbath. I could at least remove the iron plates from the electrolysis tub in the morning, and finish building the final transformer core. I then spent a little time messing with my phage cultures, and trying to measure exactly which cultures had experienced the least growth, before washing out the phages and starting over again. I then started the radio and listened to the sermon before transcribing my Bible recordings and heading down to the underwater dome for tending the gardens, maintaining the seams, and feeding the sharks before having lunch. They seemed to be responding not only to the shark collar first, but also to the fact that I do this on a particular day, suggesting that they not only perceive the passage of time, but are also able to count the days knowing that I come to feed them every seven days, and around the same time, as a few were already present when I arrived at the dome. This implies a pretty sophisticated level of intelligence for a fish, not that it really surprised me for sharks. However, I'll have to test this assertion by shaking the shark collar sometime in the middle of the week and see if it gets a stronger response. I considered bringing some of my writing stuff to the dome, so I could enjoy the serenity, but I was worried about getting the pages wet. Besides, prolonged exposure to a high-pressure, high-oxygen atmosphere is not healthy. I returned to my study and continued my writing. I'd had several days away from it to let different ideas form in my head and die off between tasks. I spent most of the afternoon writing about the Channelwood Age next, since it was another one of my favorites from Mist, and kind of fit with where I was taking the story. Aside from what had already been written about it within the story, I again ran into the issue that it didn't feel particularly lived in, as one of the few ages in the story that had clear evidence of mass habitation. I decided to expand on this as well, by adding more homey touches to the different treehouses, 
like hammocks hanging from the posts and lintels, and bits of art decorating different objects and structures. Some had specialized work sites, particularly fish traps and lobster pots, which is where I assume they got a lot of their food. Maybe hooks or lines hanging from the ceiling in some houses where fish used to be hung out to dry, next to pots full of salt. But because this was also a place I expected many of Cirrus and Akinar's slaves came from, I also thought this relationship ought to be displayed in their art, such as their pottery or on wooden totems, particularly around the topmost levels, demonstrating both veneration and fear for the brothers, who were worshipped as gods, and no doubt enforced absolute obedience. At the same time, though, I wanted to give subtle hints in the artwork and contents of the different buildings that told a subtle story of hope, that even in the midst of oppression, people still hold on to hope and perform small acts of kindness, like holding on to keepsakes whose relevance may only be clear to an outsider in hindsight, like a pretty rock or crystal from the mines in Selenitic, which would not have been native to Channelwood, subtle protests of the powers that be by poking fun of them in the inhabitants' private art, or even an incomplete mechanical hand or hook in one of the workshops, as it seems suggested that one of the devices on the third level was for chopping off people's hands, while a divine hologram of Akinar pronounced some sort of judgment over them in their own language. I added these details as well to the story. I was familiar with several writing tricks, and took care to avoid writing in the conclusions a reader was supposed to draw from the scenes described, just the scenes themselves, which kind of forced me to think backwards from effect to cause. This is the heart of Show Don't Tell. At the same time, though, I started getting kind of tired of writing this chapter, because not only was the subject matter very bleak, in spite of my attempts to line it with a message of hope, but the description of the tall, coniferous trees and the cool, foggy air reminded me a lot of home so I started feeling a little homesick before I went to bed. I was thinking of putting in a missed joke for the blooper reel here, too, but I have no desire to besmirch the good words of Rand Miller. It was no, sk it was no skin off my nose. It was no skin off my nose. <laughs> I changed out the Vortex drill battery when I got up. I changed out the Vortrex... I said it again. What the heck is a Vortrex? Test their responsive list. Their responsive list. List. That gave the age a much more sinister function in the narrative, which I suppose now officially classifies as fan fiction. And yes, I am aware that I am creating a missed fan fiction in what is ostensibly already a sort of missed fan fiction. While I waited for new cultures of the, s while I waited for new, co while I waited for new con, this is the heart of show don't tell, which is kind of the opposite of everything I've been writing here. Now that I think of it, just because the journal format forces me to write it that way, changing out. <laughs> I sure hope all this missed fanfiction nonsense is rightly interpreted as praise for the series and its creators over at Siam, rather than as a copyright infringement. Hey there, thanks for listening all the way to the end, and for listening to me gush about the Mist series again. It really is a big inspiration for a lot of the stuff I've been doing in this story, explicitly or not just with my own twist of heavy scientific realism, and I often like to imagine the island in the style of the old 90s slideshow point-and-click adventure games. In fact, my first introduction to the genre wasn't even a mist game, but an edutainment game called Physicus, from a German developer called Tivola. Explains a lot, I suppose, and when I first saw Mist, I assumed it was also an educational game. Anyway, back to the YouTube stuff. 
You can press the subscribe and bell buttons if you want to get notified when I release the next video. Like if you liked it, and if you can, please share these videos with someone who you think would enjoy them, so I can find someone else who likes the same things I do. If you had any thoughts, stories, or perspectives on the episode, like gushing about your own favorite point-and-click adventure games, or favorite misstages, feel free to share them in the comments section below. I genuinely love to hear them, and I'm always open to suggestions and corrections. That said, thanks again for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.